But hey, plot twist, he does have two loving parents. That's absolutely lovely. Now, I'm sure we can change that. What's up guys, welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be turning more of your hero OCs into villains. I don't know about you guys, but I love sapping the good energy out of protagonist characters and giving them so much trauma that they'll never recover. So with that being said, let me introduce you guys to our victims today. Once again, in my search for OCs to destroy, I've gone into our Patreon Discord server and asked my patrons to submit some of their hero OCs. They want me to turn evil. I took a look through some of them. I read through all of these stories. I love all of them, but there are a couple here that I think would make really good villains today. First up, look at this beautiful drawing. Absolutely fantastic work by Nana. I hope I'm not too late, LOL. Nana, you're not too late. <laughs> See what I did? <sighs> Stop it. This is Cirilla Lin, a young guardian who is the leader of her army. Very impressive. Seems to be doing well in life so far. Good for her. We're going to have a say about that. It's their duty to protect this gem that provides power to their kingdom, Astrus. She's very loyal, but she's also stubborn and will speak her mind. Her eyes glow a bright blue when she's in battle. And of course, it wouldn't be an OC without some serious trauma, so both of her parents died in a war when she was very young. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Lovely. She's been raised by her uncle who used to be the leader of the army she's leading. Now, she does have a weakness though, her little brother. Mm, good to know. Very good to know. She'd do anything for his safety and happiness. Overall, she cares a lot about her comrades and she'll always put them and the citizens first. She spends most of her time training her little brother and staying in the front lines of the kingdom. She's got weaknesses. There's a lot that we can work with here to turn her into a villain. So today we're gonna ruin her life, but she's not the only one. No. No, no, no. Here's our second victim, Cassian Hughes. Oh, poor Cassian. Cassian here comes from a late 1800s London-inspired steampunk fantasy world. Didn't we do a steampunk in the last video? Y'all love your steampunk themes, huh? He has experienced average main character trauma. Okay, based on the type of trauma that you guys give to your characters, I feel like he's probably been through a lot. And also just judging by the scars on his body, Boy, you put him through some stuff. But hey, plot twist, he does have two loving parents. That's absolutely lovely. Now, I'm sure we can change that. He's a doctor of sorts. He works in a hospital some of the week, and the rest of the week, he has his own practice where he offers free health care. Mmm, very suspicious, very suspicious. He does this as he knows how hard it is to afford health care. How nice of him. As a whole, he's quite serious, but has a very warm side, and he gets really playful and content when he's around the people he cares for. So very wholesome, very nice character, but you know what they say, nothing in this world ever comes for free. You want free healthcare, you gotta pay your taxes. I gotta break my leg three times a year just to get my money's worth. It's actually broken right now. Anyways, now it's time to procreate. Pause. So the first character that we have here that we're gonna turn into a villain today is Cirilla. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna lay down some foundations, come up with a pose, come up with a basic sketch, and while we're doing that, I'll tell you guys a little story about how she became a villain. Story time, Sam does stories. So as you guys know, in this current universe, she is a commander of sorts for an army in Astra. I'm sure you could be a hero to your own people if you're leading an army, but you're also gonna make a lot of enemies in doing so. Now, in my version, in the villain version of her story, one day on a dark and thunderous night, she returns from a mission to find her brother, lying in a pool of his own blood. She is utterly distraught. She is terrified. She finds her brother with a knife buried in his chest. Oh, but we're not going to stop it there. We're going to make life even worse for her. The knife contains some kind of black magic that curses the body of her brother, reducing him to an unhuman state. And it also shatters his soul into a million pieces so he can no longer find peace in the afterlife. Oh, but we're not gonna end just there. In utter shock, Cirilla carries her brother's body and rushes as quickly as she can to find her uncle. And as she swings open the door, she finds her uncle in a pool of his own blood, murdered. She then calls up her second and third in command, but they were nowhere to be seen. It seems as though they fled the city. Who could it have been? She kept her brother's deformed and cursed body close to her because this is all that she has left. And as she searched for the perpetrators of this terrible crime, she came across clues that all pointed towards the people in her own army, her trusted comrades, those who she cared about the most, the people she fought for and the people she sacrificed so much to protect. And suddenly, not only did she lose the only family she had left, she also lost her purpose. She continued 
continued to carry her cursed brother's body who now no longer resembles what he used to look like at all. She discovered a dark and twisted plot from the very people she trusted in a bid for them to take power away from her and her family. Being absolutely overcome with rage and grief over this tragic night, she set out on a rampage against all who plotted against her. This included other commanders in the army, people in the nobility, until eventually she uncovered that the Queen of Astra herself, the very person she served, was also part of the scheme. So Cirilla, with a band of trusted warriors at her side still, staged a military coup on the capital of Astra. She swore to avenge her brother and to never again allow for these political games to be played. With her at the helm, now there's a new military rule. Now as for the drawing, at this stage we're gonna add in some color blocking, some flat colors for our characters, and then after we've done this, we can start adding in some shadows for our render. But as for Cirilla, in this version of the world, she became more and more paranoid. Without the wisdom and the guidance of her uncle, she becomes more and more extreme in her ideologies. She begins to crack down on all political dissent. All right, and I think the base colors here look pretty good, so let's start up a new layer, okay? And we're gonna add a clipping mask and set this to multiply. Now it's time for shadows. I'm thinking of maybe putting the whole character in shadow and giving her like a side lighting. Let's see how that looks. Anyway, so as I was saying, you know, she grows more paranoid and with such unchecked power, in such an unhealthy mental state, the military coup conducted by Cirilla becomes an absolute nightmare for the average citizen. Look at that lighting. Now I'm gonna start up a new layer here and we're gonna start getting into some details and really fleshing out this character. She's got a lot of details here in the original. Oh, it's gonna be difficult. She begins with subjugating innocents to unfair trials, and then she moves on to executing people who she could not even definitively prove committed a crime, all in the name of absolute stability for the empire, as she vows never to allow what happened to her to happen ever again. And life in Astra slowly becomes a living nightmare. The citizens are prosecuted. Cirilla's elite army now terrorizes her own kingdom, all in search for traitors. And as you guys can see here, I've actually incorporated her cursed brother here into part of her character design because Cirilla herself, she promised her brother that he will never have to leave her side ever again and that she will protect him at all costs. So now being immobile, being unable to communicate, being a shell of what he used to be, she allows him to cling to her and shares part of her life force with him. In this dark and unhappy version of this universe, her brother is all that is left to her. Her brother is all that matters to her. And despite the harm and the hardships that she's in inflicted on the people of Astra, she still believes that she's doing the right thing, that she's just protecting her brother. She swears to herself that somewhere in this embrace, she still feels a glimmer, a sliver of warmth from what used to be her beloved sibling. Anyway, so that was a pretty long story, but I just really wanted to, you know, uh, destroy her life. You know, oftentimes I think that heroes and villains can have the same kind of beginning to their stories, but depending on the kind of trauma that you inflict onto your characters and how much trauma you inflict onto your characters, their lives might take a very dramatic turn, like Cirilla's here. And speaking of turns and twists, I'll let you in on a little secret. It wasn't actually the other army commanders or any of the people that she was close with who enacted this plot. It was all a very successful spy campaign from a rival empire, so all the people she killed to gain power actually were innocent but we're not gonna tell her that. I definitely love the gold and white armor design here. I think it's a really good look for the character. And I think, you know, for the villain version, it's good to stick with the same color scheme here because even though white and gold, it tends to give you like a good guy kind of vibe and it might not be what you envision a villain to look like, but in Cirilla's mind, she is a hero. It's really quite a tragic story. I almost feel bad for her, almost. Gonna just bring out this silhouette of her face here with some rim light. I love my rim light. Oh yeah, look at that. Beautiful. I think at this point, the only hope that we have left for Astra is that maybe some heroic champion will rise from the shadows and challenge the accursed queen. Let's add some final shiny touches onto the armor here. Gonna bump up the saturation. Just gonna move the lighting forward a little bit. One hour later. And there we go. You've just witnessed the birth of Cirilla, the accursed queen. 
Oh, I wish her all the best. Our next victim is Dr. Cassian Hughes. Now the Cassian that you know in the good guy universe, he really puts in the work. He's genuinely a great character. He puts in so many hours at the hospital and yet when he comes home, he still finds it in his heart to provide free healthcare for people just because he knows this is not something that everyone can afford. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch in this world. Free always comes at a cost. Now in my villain version of him, things are gonna be a little bit different. And no, we are not gonna destroy his parents. In fact, he has a happy family. He has friends. He has no problem with his love life. The only problem here is he's got a bit of a hobby. You see, because he works at the hospital, he comes into contact with a lot of death. And ever since he was a wee lad, Cassian's always been the type to have hyper fixations on things. Whenever he finds something he's interested in, whenever he picks up a new hobby, he always goes so deep down the rabbit hole. But this time, he became really fascinated with the concept of life and death. When he works at the hospital and there's a patient on the verge of dying, he always wondered, at what point did the lights go out? Now keep in mind the steampunk world is inspired by 1800s England. So I'm sure the technology and medication wasn't exactly super advanced. There was a truly minimal understanding of the way the human body functions. Cassian was a bit of a philosopher. He wanted to find out at what point did something actually come to life? At what point was something truly alive or dead? He wanted to run experiments. Now I'm sure you see where this is going, but the hospital of course wouldn't let him do that. There's no way he was gonna test his theories on patients at the hospital with all the witnesses nearby. So under the guise of providing free and accessible healthcare to the public, he opened up his own clinic. But it was more than that, it was a chop shop. He was very smart about it though. He knew how not to get caught. He did extensive research on anyone who booked appointments at his clinic. Well, the reason for that is, if the person booking the appointment is relatively well known, or just in general has a good amount of connections in society, he'll actually provide genuine free healthcare for them. You know, by the way of medicinal herbs or surgical procedures, he will fit them into his schedule. But that's actually just a marketing scheme. He's hoping that word of mouth will reach the more downtrodden people in society, the people who were down on their luck, who might not have any loved ones nearby, that if they were to go missing, no one would come looking for them. And when he did find the people who fit the profile of what he was looking for, oh, he cut them up. He cut them up into little pieces. Not for no reason though, he's doing scientific research. Cassian, you see, being fascinated by life and death, used these experiments to satisfy his curiosity. He wanted to know at what point is a person truly dead? And at what point, does a person come alive? One of his current passion projects is to create life from death. So of course, he needed parts for this and the parts come from the people. So if you fit his victim profile, he will sedate you. And before you could even wake up, your body would have been dismembered into little parts or worse. Now you see in this image, he's holding another one of his passion projects. He's got many of those. This is the skull of one of his victims. But it's not just the skull. Because he has such great anatomical knowledge from his time working at the hospital, he kept the brain intact. He drilled holes into it. He created mechanical features that allowed the brain to remain alive. So this victim here is uh, unfortunately fully conscious and very much aware of the predicament that they're in. Now you might ask, well, doesn't Cassian feel bad for doing this? Doesn't he feel for the victims? You know, the downtrodden of society. This version of him, he's got a pretty corrupt moral compass. Our boy Cassian Cassian here genuinely believes that he is doing good, that through this research he'll come across new medical breakthroughs, treatments and methods that he could actually use to help people in society. In his eyes, the sacrifice of a few hundred unwilling victims was more than worth the price. And he believed that he was doing a good thing. I think we have a common theme here today of villains who believe that they're doing good. So I'm just tweaking this a bit. I want there to be like all kinds of tubes and machinery connected to this skull to keep it alive. The skull back when it was uh, attached to its owner uh, was named Andy. Sorry, Andy. So same as before, we're coming in here and adding some shadows. I think I want a simple top-down kind of lighting. Now Cassian's actually very cautious about covering up his steps and not allowing anyone in his life to find out about this morbid hobby that he has. But one of these days, he might target the wrong person. And maybe the story will begin of him trying to cover his tracks in a sort of last ditch, desperate attempt to save his skin. I'm sure Cassian here would go to absolute great lengths to preserve himself. So I'm adding some different color irises in the skull just to accentuate the fact that they didn't come from the same person and they probably didn't actually belong to the skull in the first place. Cassian just wanted to test uh, whether or not the skull can see through someone else's eyes, whether or not life can transfer through these 
different organs. He's just a very curious guy. He just wants to improve society in his own way, albeit he's a little bit misguided. His prosthetic here kind of releases these extra arms out, and he's really taking full advantage of this to be able to help him during his operations and procedures. Now in this story, all the scars on his body come from his own experiments. They come at his own hand. He would run experiments where he tries to graft pieces of skin onto other people's bodies, and sometimes he would graft the skin of other people onto himself, just to see whether or not it's stays alive. It all comes from a fascination of life and death. I'm going to add some more details here into the hair just to give him more of a silhouette. And as a bit of a final touch for Cassian here, we're going to give him some splatters of blood from his operations. Just a little bit, you know, not too much though. We got to keep this PG-13. Going to add on just some final details here like highlights on the skin, highlight on the eyes, and... Five hours later. After some rendering, there's our second villain, Cassian Hughes. If you sign up for a free treatment with him, he just might use your body. I'm sorry. Anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed watching this video. Hopefully you enjoyed these villain stories. As always, let me know which villain you connected with more. Was it the curious, scientific, and good-natured, good-hearted Cassian Hughes? Or was it the cursed queen? of Astra. Let me know guys. And uh, thanks for watching this video. This video is sponsored by nobody. So check out my Patreon for monthly tutorials. If you want to support the work that I do, uh, hit subscribe if you want to see more of this. And uh, with that being said, I'll see you guys on the next video. We've pretty successfully destroyed two people's lives today. So that's good. Excellent. I love it. Oh man. I feel like Oh, I feel like coming up with these traumatizing villain stories is just so much easier than coming up with a hero. Like, what is that? Like, am I just unhinged? Maybe I am. <laughs>